my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favouritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith, to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Many tri mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God and thank you to Jack and Lucy for that reading. Uh, you may be wondering why we had two readers tonight. It's because we wanted to hear both of their beautiful voices and it's because we're that inefficient. Uh, because we asked both of them to provide a, a, a reading on video for us tonight. Uh, but it also shows just we're really committed to trying to connect as a family all the way through this strange lockdown period. So we are in James, the book of James as a church uh, in this season. It's a fantastic book. And the passage we've just heard is all about Jesus. It's all about the gospel. It, it may not seem to be, but that's because James isn't like, the, like Paul who wrote a lot of the New Testament where he would define everything, unpack everything, explain it all carefully. What James does is he says, I presume you understand Jesus and the gospel. Now let me tell you what your life should look like if you are living this out. And that's what he's doing in this passage. So he begins in this way in chapter two. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. So we mustn't show favoritism. That's the issue he wants to address. It might seem a really small one, but what we're going to discover tonight is this is at the heart of who Jesus is. It's at the heart of the gospel, and it's a really important thing for us to address as followers of Jesus. So what does James mean by favoritism? Well, he's really clear. First of all, in verse 4, he defines it as not discriminating. Discrimination is the unjust or prejudicial treatment of a person or a group of people according to the category you place them in. It's where you respond in a lesser way because you value somebody less. And then James illustrates it. He gives us an example so that we're really clear what he's talking about. And he talks about when people come into church and he says, if a rich man comes in and he's wearing all the fine clothes uh, and we look at him and we say, great, we're going to give you the best seat in the house. And then a poor man comes in and James says that he's wearing filthy old clothes. And, and the language James uses in the original Greek that he's writing in is really strong. This is, this is stuff that implies smell and urine and rags. And he says, when somebody comes in smelling and wearing clothes like that, and you make them stand at the back, that's what favoritism is. Honoring the rich and pushing the, the poor to the side. He said that this cannot happen in the Christian community. We see it happen all the time in the world, don't we, where we differentiate according to appearance, where you might 
decide on your social media feeds who you associate with, who you friend, who you follow, according to uh, whether they look good or whether they have influence or however many friends and how popular they are. We see it happening all around us that image is everything. And if people don't fit the image, then actually they're not valuable to us anymore. James says not in church. And we'll come to church in, in a moment. Because it happens, but it mustn't, and it's really important to God. So I once saw an opportunity to counter this um, and to think, how can I just step against this and show a different attitude? And I'm on something called the Church of England's General Synod, and that means that we have to meet in London. And when we're in London, they give us a generous hotel expense allowance. And so I was put up in a really swanky four-star hotel overlooking the Thames, uh, looking out onto the Houses of Parliament. And they'd given me a twin room. And I thought, who could I take with me? Who could I bless with an opportunity to go to London? My family weren't available to come. And I felt God say, take this particular person who I'd built a friendship with. He'd come and he and I got to know each other through him coming to Trinity through our triangle homelessness ministry. He was now in a flat on his own, but he suffered from mental health difficulties. Uh, he, was, he was really poor, and yeah, he struggled with his clothing, and he smelt. There's no way, two ways about it. And I thought, he's just the kind of person that I want to bless with an opportunity to stay in a four-star hotel in the middle of London. So he and I went uh, into this hotel lobby to check in, and you could see all the people around us looking at him, saying he shouldn't be here. And I'm speaking to him quietly and saying, don't let them look down on you. You deserve to be here. You're just as valuable as them. You're a child of the living God. You're a prince of the king of kings. And he stayed with me, and people continued to be not quite sure about him, and it just made me happy that actually in the church, we could value him and show him how much value he had. James says, the church has to be a place where there's no favoritism. And he says, if you do act like that in the church, you've become evil. He says, you are like an evil judge, a, ju a judge who judges with evil thoughts. And, and the literal phrase, the understanding of that phrase that he's using is a judge that takes a bribe. Now, James is really helpful in using that phrase because he's helping us to understand that at the heart of favoritism is where we make our relationships transactional, where we, we decide what we're going to get from that person and we adjust our behavior accordingly. So the judge who's going to get a bribe changes his judgment in order to get that financial reward. What we can do in our relationships is we can look at the attractive person and say, we're going to get some reflected glory if we're friends with them. We can look at the rich person. They might give us some of their wealth. We can look at the influential person. We might get some of their help and their power and their support. And so we change our behavior and we seek to build relationship and to really uh, sort of respect them and, and, and connect with them. Whereas with the person that the world says is ugly, unpopular, without influence or wealth, we choose to ignore them and say that they're not valuable. That's what transactional relationships look like. And James says they're evil. Why? Why must we have a different attitude in church? It's because this is what Jesus looks like. And because Jesus, in his incredible love, Value, showed that he values every single human being equally. Just before I get into Jesus' example, I just want to give a nod to Lat Blaylock. He, um, he really preached my sermon this week because he did one of our daily devotions. I don't know if you connect him with them on Facebook, but I really encourage you to because they're a way of getting some scripture into your life every day with a short video reflection, five to ten minutes. But what I love about them is you see the faith in the members of the church, and that strengthened you. I go, yeah, I, I love what Lat said. He believes what I believe about Jesus. It builds that relationship, even though we can't be together at the moment. And I love how we're trying to create these points of connection, even during this COVID um, lockdown period. 
So what Lat said was, he said that to, to be a Christian, it means to become Christ-like. And what that means is to love what Jesus loves. And he says that he had to pray, or in his case, sing a song that was from his era, uh, to say, teach me to love the unlovely, O Lord. I don't know how to do it. That's what James is teaching in this passage. And he's telling us that it's because of Jesus that we're called to this. Beginning of that passage that I've just read to you, he says, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. He's saying, if you know how glorious Jesus is, how wonderful he is, how supreme he is of everything, then you need to look like him. You need to follow him. And if you're doing that, then you won't show any favoritism because there is no favoritism in God. Or as as Bruce used to say, everyone's his favorite. However you want to, to look at it, God has no favoritism. His love is complete for every single one of us. And that's what Jesus showed. Jesus is glorious, not just because of his incredible glory in heaven, where his appearance is like the sun, as bright as the brightest thing we could imagine. But he explained that when he was on earth, his greatest moment of glory was when he went to the cross. Jesus' glory is shown in the fact that he left the glory of heaven, came to earth, and gave dignity to every human being by becoming human. And then as he lived on this earth, he showed his love without favoritism as he touched those who were ceremonially unclean or those with leprosy. How he got close to those who were the outcasts or rejected by the religion at the time. How he was known as those who was a friend of sinners and the people that nobody else would hang around with. He lived this out. And then he loved every single one of us when he went to the cross and he died for us. This is the example of Jesus. Later James says that the name of Jesus is the noble name of him to whom you belong. He says if you really keep the royal law found in scripture. James is saying if you belong to Jesus then you're going to look like him. You're going to honor everything that he honors and values. And you're going to follow in his majestic ways. Now the depth of this passage is that in the illustration that James gives about that poor man with that filthy, smelly clothing and appearance, you and I are that man compared with Jesus. We, in our selfishness, and sin are like the prodigal son who ends up in Jesus' parable in the pigsty. We're covered in the muck of that place. We smell terrible. And yet as we turn towards God, turn towards home, we discover that God in his love runs to us, embraces us, kisses us, and cleans us up, puts his righteousness on us. That's what Jesus does to us, the poor and smelly and foul people that we are compared with him. This is our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And then, in the most profound understanding of this passage, we remember that Jesus not only embraces us, but he becomes like us. When on the cross, he takes our sin upon him and he becomes despised. This is how Isaiah prophesied it in Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain. He bore our sufferings, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. This is our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. 
He became like us. He took his, our sin upon him in order to win the victory over that so he could forgive us, show us his mercy and his justice through dying on the cross for us so that we could be restored. I've been reading recently uh, this book called Gentle and Lowly. It's, a, it's an interesting choice of title, isn't it? You, it might not grab you or if you're looking in a bookshelf, but it comes from that phrase from Matthew 11 where Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It's a beautiful book that describes the heart of Jesus towards us. And tonight, I just want you to, to grasp how much he doesn't show any favoritism to you. How he doesn't turn away from you because of the things he knows about you. When you blow it, it doesn't change how he loves you at all. But he longs to embrace you. And in this book, it, it just talks about what we're talking about tonight. So I'm just going to read a couple of passages from this book. The writer says, We project onto Jesus skewed instincts about how the world works. Human nature did dictates that the wealthier a person, the more they tend to look down on the poor. The more beautiful a person, the more put, they are put off by the ugly. And without realizing what we're doing, we quietly assume that the one so high and exalted has corresponding difficulty drawing near to the despicable and unclean like us. Sure, we know that Jesus comes close to us, we agree. But he holds his nose, doesn't he? No, the Holy Christ does not cringe at reaching out and touching dirty sinners. Such embrace is precisely what he loves to do. He cannot bear to hold back. We naturally think of Jesus touching us the way a little boy reaches out to touch a slug for the first time, face screwed up and cautiously extending an arm, giving a yelp of disgust upon contact and instantly withdrawing. No, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. This is our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you. He wants to be close to you. He shows no reaction against you because of anything about you, your appearance, your behavior. Nothing changes his love for you. That's the amazing truth. But the challenge is, that he wants you to be like him. That's what James is talking about in this passage. This is discipleship. This is following Jesus, becoming like him. He's talking about what would we look like if we had the heart of Jesus in us? If everything we did came out of his love, uh, was ruled over by his kingdom and his peace, his mercy in every action that we took. This is what we would look like, and there would be no favoritism. Every Christian is to become a little Christ, said C.S. Lewis. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing less. And Jesus himself said this, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So the church, Christians, we're meant to love in the way that Jesus did, in that incredibly merciful and gracious way where his love doesn't change according to anything about that person. Now, we care for the poor here at Holy Trinity. I'm so proud of that. That's what Christians and churches should look like. We, we do triangle for the homeless and the vulnerable house, Trinity money advice for those in debt, the food bank, sapphires for those who are involved in the sex trade. We really want to care for the poor. But what James is talking about in this passage is not just caring for them in some paternal way. He's talking about our hearts towards them. And he's asking, how do you respond to people? And the danger is, is that whilst we might care for the poor, we might also keep our distance from them. And depending on how we judge people, how we value people, 
our response can be very different according to our value system that is just there beneath the surface, hidden and subconscious sometimes, and yet so often it's betrayed in how we behave. We know in this country that we've, we've been exposed in the ongoing racism and the way in which we uh, discriminate against people according to their race and the color of their skin. That cannot happen. And it certainly cannot happen in church. It can't happen on the basis of, po of wealth or influence, on the basis of what people wear and what their appearance look like. It can't be on the basis of where they come from, their class. It can't be on the basis of their sexuality. No quality or category should change how we respond to people. We are called to love them with an unconditional love that Jesus calls us to and shows to us. I remember when Jesus convicted me of some of this in my life. I don't know if you know Martin and Clara Manyama and their children. They're a wonderful blessing to us at Holy Trinity. But when they came to us a few years ago, they were asylum seekers. They had no money. Uh, they couldn't give to the church because they only received food vouchers. And so Martin wanted to serve the church. And so he cleaned the church for free. So generous, so humble. And as I saw him one day in the church, I felt God speak to me and say, you've missed this man. As I prayed about that, I felt God say, this is a man of God before you. And so I deliberately sought to build a relationship with Martin. And over those years, he and I have become close friends. And I have been blessed through his friendship. And I've discovered in him that he's not the cleaner. He's not the asylum seeker, the labels that I or the world might put upon him. He is a man of God of extraordinary faith. And the beginning of lockdown in March last year, he and I said, let's pray together during lockdown. We thought it would just be for 15 minutes in the middle of the day. We ended up discovering that we wanted to pray longer. And so for every day in lockdown since March uh, began, uh, other than when I've been on holiday or when I've overslept, which has been a few times, we've got up at either five or six o'clock in the morning and prayed together over the phone for an hour. And I've been blessed by Martin's faith. He's taught me about Jesus Christ. He's given me an example of prayer and faith that I didn't have in my own life. But I could easily have missed him because of my prejudice. So the question I want to ask you is, where in your life is there the sign that you are building relationship, not on the normal lines of social um, sort of uh, relationships in which we like the people like us and which we we go for the people who have some value to us but because we're in the same Christian family or because they're in your neighborhood or your network and you're deliberately looking for the people that you can love who wouldn't otherwise be loved or the people who you can love who are different from you where are you choosing to do that Three final things that James says very quickly. First of all, he says, there's a difference between the poor and the rich. In verse 5, he says, um, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world um, to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? And then he goes on to say, aren't the rich the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? He's saying there's so often a difference, and isn't that the case? I've certainly found that, that with the poor, they're so often ready to say yes to Jesus, to admit that they, they need him, they need his love, that they can't make it on their own, that they've messed up, they need his forgiveness. There's a faith that is ready to respond, which isn't trying to be hidden or trying to hold it together. They just love Jesus as he loves them, and they respond freely to him, and it's beautiful. But for us who come from a wealthier background, from a middle class background, we've been taught by the world to control ourselves, to earn our way, to achieve things, uh, and to make it our way and to be in control. We have a pride and intellectual superiority so often. And when it comes to faith, we don't like to admit that we've got it all wrong, that we need Jesus that it compared with him, we are filthy and smelly and rotten in our sinfulness and selfishness. And so we hold back. 
and we try to keep it all under control and we don't respond with a freedom and a faith because of who Jesus is. We need to learn from the poor, not just care for them. Then James says this is not a side issue and not an optional extra. He says it's like the core of the, the, the law. He says, God says you should not commit adultery and God says you should not commit murder. But if you do commit adultery and um, do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. And he says that if you don't show anyone mercy, then you won't be shown mercy either. He's saying it's this important to God because it's at the heart of God because he loves people so much. So don't think this is a side issue. Take this seriously tonight, friends. And the final thing to say, which is the really good news, is that the passage finishes with, but mercy triumphs over judgment. One day we will be judged by Jesus Christ, but his forgiveness and his mercy through the cross triumph over it. But more than that, the mercy of God can triumph over our judgment, can triumph over our prejudice and our favoritism. And what James tells us to do here is the secret to you and I growing in the character of Christ, of his love and mercy and grace. It's by starting to do it even before you feel like doing it, by choosing to find an opportunity to love those who can't give you a return, to love those who the world might think are unlovely, to look for those opportunities and to choose to do it. Now, we can't necessarily do that in church because we can't gather in this way, but we can do it through our friendships already. We can do it in our neighborhoods where God gives us an opportunity to care for somebody. I encourage you to to look for an opportunity to love someone in this way. And what you'll find is as you begin to do that, you create a channel of God's grace and mercy to flow through you and you begin to capture his heart for that person. You begin to be changed by that and his mercy begins to triumph over judgment. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are glorious. You are wonderful. You have loved us in the most incredible way. And we thank you that we can never change that love by anything we ever do. Lord, we want to look like you. As we receive your love afresh this evening, as we receive your mercy afresh this evening, we pray that you would fill us with your love, fill us with your mercy. And we ask, Lord, that you would lead us to, to live in such a way that we love in the way you loved. We don't show favoritism or prejudice. And that we as your people reflect something of your character and your love. Lord, may others be blessed by us and blessed by you through the way we live. For your glory's sake. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a great song now that allows us just to say, I need, first of all, to receive mercy from Jesus, our champion. And as he tells us who we are in him, as he speaks to our spirits of our identity in him, we then rise up and see him do the most extraordinary things in our lives. So let's worship together.